Hi, my name is Stephen Artandi. I'm the director of the Stanford Cancer Institute, and I want to welcome you to our Breakthroughs in Cancer seminar series, uh, where we have Dr. Ron Levy, who's well known to all of us, who will give um, a really exciting seminar called The History of Monoclonal Antibodies and the Future of Cancer Vaccines. Just stay tight, because I have a little bit of an introduction, Ron, so <laughs> don't jump up on the stage yet. Um, this seminar series is meant to be our highest impact trans translational cancer seminar series on campus. We bring luminaries in transla translational cancer science to campus from all over the country, but today we have one of our own Stanford uh, leaders in this space. So if we look at our upcoming lineup, next up is Ines Efantis at NYU, followed by Lorenzo Nardo and Cornelia Ulrich. So we continue in this vein of exciting cancer talks. I just want to give a plug for some of our upcoming events. We have our CCRTP Comprehensive Cancer Research Training Program, which is in its 14th or 15th year now. And that's um, in, in Redwood City this year on September 16th through 18th. So please mark your calendars for that. We also are hosting an exciting meeting here, Advances in Mass Spectrometry Enabled Drug Discovery on October 29th, and you can find more about these events on our events page at the Stanford Cancer Institute. Um, okay, so for today's seminar format, we'll have 45 minutes of science, followed by 15 minutes or so of Q&A, and then please join us outside for a reception afterwards. So now I'd like to introduce um, Ron Levy. I'll give the, the uh, formal um, introduction first. And so uh, Dr. Levy is the Robert Summey and Helen Summey Professor of Medicine and the Associate Director of Translational Science in the Cancer Institute. His research has focused on monoclonal antibodies and the study of malignant lymphoma. Um, currently using tools of immunology and molecular biology to develop a better understanding of initiation and progression of, malignant, of this malignant process. He was the first to treat lymphoma and cancer with monoclonal antibodies and helped to develop rituximab, one of the biggest blockbuster cancer drugs um, that we've ever seen to treat lymphoma. And his work uh, concentrates on using lymphoma receptors as targets for new therapies for lymphoma. He's published over 300 articles. He's received numerous awards. And I'll just touch on a couple of those. The Arm and Hammer Award for Cancer Research. Um, let's see. the. Most recently, the King Faisal International Prize in Medicine. He was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. And I just want to uh, make some personal comments, which is that I first became aware of Dr. Levy's work uh, back in the 1980s before I was even in medical school or in graduate school. And I read um, a lay science piece on uh, Ron and his work in making um, anti idiotypic antibodies to lymphoma. And I was just blown away by this. I've, I've searched for this article for many years and I haven't been able to find it, so it's still out there. But in my um, searches, I found this New York Times article from 1982. Uh, the title is The Genetic Assault on Cancer. Uh, and it's quite a good article. And of course, it's a time capsule as well. And so you can see that it starts off uh, uh, talking about Bob Weinberg when he was asked what causes cancer. He said he could only hazard a guess. Something gone awry in genetic programming of a normal cell uh, might cause that cell to proliferate out of control. If you press him to describe what that something might be, he shrugged. This was in 1982. Um, and of course, at that right around that time, we, he'd also, Weinberg also discovered that uh, there, there were oncogenes that were mutated. Uh, so he provided some answer to this. Um, and there's a quote by David Baltimore, who won the Nobel Prize uh, for having discovered um, reverse transcriptases, and he has a really interesting quote. As long as I have been in science, there has been some form of new experimentation in treating cancer, and a lot of good things have been done, says Baltimore. Uh, but the cancer cell has more up its sleeve than most people give it credit for. I don't see us solving these problems in the short run. So that was pretty prescient, I would say, um, when a lot of people are saying that the cures for cancer are right around the corner and relatively easy uh, to achieve. So this is also from that same article, and it says that last ma March, the New England Journal of Medicine published this case history of the first cancer patients treated with antibodies from this new source, monoclonal antibodies. It was a 67-year-old man at Stanford 
uh, who suffered from a rare malignancy that had uh, raged through his lymphatic system, only told him spreading to liver, spleen, bone marrow, and blood. After six months of painstaking experiments, a team headed by Dr. Ron Levy developed a variety of antibody that would be effective against this unusual cancer. Halfway through the patient's four-week-long treatment of eight injections, the, the fever and chronic night sweats that characterized lymphoma vanished. Over the next three weeks, the clinicians reported the patient's enlarged lymphomas gradually became smaller. Blah, blah. Nearly a year and a half later, without further therapy of any kind, he remains disease-free. And um, this is that the um, that uh, case report in the New England Journal, uh, treatment of B-cell lymphoma with multiple anti-atypic antibody. And so, as Ron will tell you about, and and, and we all learned from Ron, um, and I learned from preparing for this lecture that uh, Ron has maybe the most New England Journal papers of anyone on campus. Uh, he's very modest about that, but uh, that's what I've learned when reading about uh, his, his work on lymphoma. He defined um, that lymphomas were monoclonal, that they generally had a single idiotype. Idiotype is the very low portion of the, of the immunoglobulin molecule, and he made antibodies against that idiotype called anti-idiotypic antibodies. Um, I want to turn things over to Ron, but I just want to say that, that Ron is um, not just a, a leader in science and medicine, but he was also a, a, an academic leader. He ran the Division of Oncology for, for 20 years and built that into the powerhouse that it is today. Um, he is really the prototype of a, of a physician scientist using basic science principles to make fundamental discoveries about disease and then translating those to bring those discoveries to patients. So with that introduction, I just want to welcome Ron Levy to the stage. So uh, I chose a pretty good title, let's see, because it brought a lot of people out to hear it. Um, a lot of people in the audience could give this talk and, and tell the things that I, I'm going to leave out. So apologies to everybody I slight. This is going to be a personal journey through this, these topics. And I'll start with these disclosures. We don't usually spend enough time on disclosure slides, I think. Uh, people usually flash them so you can't read them and get, get right on with it. But I think I want to emphasize the fact that the people who support us, uh, well, we, we become consultants sometimes to other people, but the people who support us are really important for our clinical trials to succeed without them. And you'll see my examples today. Uh, they're very important to get things done. So I'm going to discuss uh, some off-label uses of in situ vaccination with TLR ligands. You don't know anything about this. By the end of the talk, you should be experts. So I want to start with the, uh, so we all understand together that there are two arms of the adaptive immune system that are important to understand. Uh, these are cells that are in the blood called B cells and T cells. And there are millions and billions of these cells circulating around. As Irv Weissman tells us, the purpose of the heart is to circulate the immune system around the body. <laughs> and the principle that is important to understand to follow what I'm going to tell you is that one cell makes one antibody. Every cell, every B cell creates an antibody by shuffling the genes that code for it in a different way and produces an antibody into the blood and the circulation, which is unique for each cell. The same is true for T cells. They have a receptor which is unique to each one of them. So our immune system is a collection of all these populations of cells that's shifting all the time to deal with the changing environment that we have to respond to. And memory in the system is based on these populations where every cell makes only one and locks in that commitment, that genetic commitment. So when I was a medical student, I had the chance to work at the Weizmann Institute in Israel I, and I met up with a postdoc there by the name, from Philadelphia by the name of Norman Kleinman. And Norman was doing the following experiment. He was culturing these little pieces of the spleen from mice and growing them for a while in vitro. And he was cloning the cells from one mouse into another mouse. These are identical twin mice so they can accept tissues one from another. And he was immunizing the donor mouse uh, with an antigen he could measure and transferring just the right number of cells intravenously into the recipient mouse. And then he was chopping up the spleen of the recipient mouse and culturing the pieces of spleen tissue. We call these today organoids, these pieces of tissue that we can culture. And if the piece of tissue received one and only one cell or none based on probability, 
getting it right in the donor population numbers, they would produce an antibody in vitro and you could stimulate them with the same antigen he showed. And I asked him, why are you doing this? What's the purpose of all this? And he said, well, I want to prove the clonal selection theory of the immune system that is based on clones committed, pre-committed to making one and only one antibody. And I want to figure out how the immune system works. And so I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, and then I was back there as a postdoc in the same Weizmann Institute in Israel a few years later, and I saw this picture published in Nature magazine. This is a, a, a mouse that doesn't have an immune system, and it's growing a human tumor in its flank, and it's been injected with a radio-labeled version of, a, of an antibody that can tell the difference between humans and mice. Now, we don't need this picture to find that tumor, and we don't need antibodies to tell us the difference between mice and humans. But that picture spoke more than a thousand words to me. It said, if you could make an antibody that could tell the difference between a cancer cell and a normal cell, look what it could do. It could find cancer in the body, it could go there and deliver radiation to that tumor, and it might be a drug. So when I came to start my lab at Stanford, I set up the Norman Clymer culture system, and I decided to immunize mice with uh, human leukemia cells and lymphoma cells, and to clone the cells the way Norman Kleinman did, and to derive antibodies in vitro, uh, shown here in this pu first publication from our lab. It's not the New England Journal of Medicine, unfortunately. It's the Journal of Immunology. And this was a technique to decide whether the antibody was really monoclonal or not. Uh, it's isoelectric focusing. The protein has a sharp peak, and that implies it's one and only one antibody, and not a mixture of many antibodies. And so, this was great. I was getting antibodies against human leukemia cells, lymphoma cells, and we could screen them for telling the difference between antibodies that would bind to leukemia cells from the person versus their normal cells. And the problem was, although these were great antibodies, there was a short supply because these cultures wouldn't live forever. They would eventually die out, and then you'd have to do it again. And you'd get a little bit of antibody, good as it was, it was good for analytic purposes, but it wasn't good for doing much continued work uh, on. And then that same year, Kohler and Milstein, who won the Nobel Prize for this, invented hybridomas. Hybridomas were a way of cloning the cells that make the antibodies by fusing them to make a hybrid cell between a cancer cell and the normal cell that make the antibodies. And they chose a really smart choice for the cancer cell. They chose a myeloma cell, a cell that's cancerous and makes its own antibody and lives forever. And eventually we could get rid of the antibody it made on its own, but we kept the immortality and the, and the ability to make and, and, and produce antibodies coded for by the genes of the donor mouse. These hybridomas live forever. They make the one antibody, once you clone them, that they know how to make, and they make that antibody forever. And we have hybridomas that we made in 1975. They're still in the lab now. How many years later, 50 years later, still making the same antibody that they made 50 years ago. And so that opened up a whole world of, of possibilities. And a lot of people saw the possibilities. They saw you can make things that can be diagnostic reagents. You can make things that can be tools for analyzing biology. You can make antibodies that can purify their molecules. And, and it was really a great, important laboratory tool. But I wanted to make drugs. I thought that these antibodies could be drugs. And here are all the reasons why people said in those days the antibodies could never be drugs. They were heterogeneous and inconsistent. Monoclonals solved that problem. They were big, but that means they hang along for a long time in the body. They were proteins. You can't eat them. You have to inject them, but that's okay. We have infusion centers. Uh, they don't get inside cells. They only recognize things outside cells. Uh, but that's okay, they can kill that way anyway. They're hard to make, but once the first one was made, it became a platform technology. Once you've made one, you can make any one in the future. And they were, four, for, for, they were originally made in mice, mice uh, B cells, and they were foreign proteins, but eventually we learned to clone the genes and make them into humans, make mice into human antibody-producing mice. So that was solved as well. So all of those problems were solved. Antibodies could be drugs. But the question was, what should they recognize? Where are we gonna find the targets 
that can tell that are different on cancer cells than on normal cells. So knowing the principle that every B cell makes only one, one, uh, one, uh, only one antibody, when that B cell becomes a malignant one and turns into lymphoma, you have a clone of cells, all that make the, the same original one. And that clone has a target, the little tip here, that's unique to the clone and different from every other B cell, a normal B cell in the body. So what an opportunity this was, to the perfect target, only on the tumor clone and not on anything normal in the body. So all we had to do was make antibodies that could recognize that uniqueness, and that's what we did. We made what are called anti-idiotype antibodies. Steve talked about this in his introduction. And that didn't turn out to be too hard to do. If you take the, uh, the tumor cell and inject the mice and then make hybridomas and screen the hybridomas for making the antibodies that can do this, you can have a drug. That's what we thought. And we tried it in mice and it worked in mice pretty well. So then we, we made it for a person, a person from our own clinic. And Richard Miller, who's sitting here in the third row, uh, made this antibody. And uh, we had a mentor by the name of Henry Kaplan at the time. And Henry Kaplan said, it's very important that the experiment work the first time. <laughs> He was taunting us. I think he was talking about one of his own experiments and bragging. But uh, here's the experiment that worked the first time. Uh, this is Mr. Carr, a 67-year-old man at the time, who went on TV Guide magazine when he was 72 years old after we had treated him with the custom-made antibody just for his, his tumor, just for his clone. And what happened was we had this antibody on the shelf for a year. We had made it, Richard had made it, and and uh, we, he had went through all the usual treatments and got to the end of the usual treatments and had lymphoma all over his, his body. And I had to go to a conference in Johns Hopkins that, that, uh, that week. And, and while I was gone, Richard, Richard and, and, and David Maloney, the student at the time, treated Mr. Carr with the antibody. <laughs> that isn't because we didn't have the plan. We had the plan, but I just wasn't in town when it happened. So here is the result. Uh, this is a lymphangiogram. Uh, there are, very few people in the audience who knows what this is. This is a, a test we used to have where, where you see that these foamy looking lymph nodes behind next in the pelvis and behind the, the retroperitoneum big mass here outlined by these dots. This is dye that was put into the, in the lymphatic channels of the feet that the, uh, that's opaque on x-rays and so you can use this, stays in there, and you can use it to measure the size of the abnormal lymph nodes. This is lymphoma. And after he was treated, after a few months later, you can see these lymph nodes shrink down, the dye stays in there, and how small they get. This is approaching normal size of lymph nodes. And eventually he went into a complete remission, and it was more than a year and a half after that that he maintained his remission. In fact, he died about 30 years later, free of his lymphoma, uh, never a problem for him again. Uh, and so this is the first example, the experiment that worked the first time. So um, we did this about 50 more times over about 10 years. And uh, Richard founded a company called IDEC. And IDEC was our supplier of custom-made antibodies for individual patients for their own tumors. Um, and it worked again and again, not as well as it worked in Philip Carr, the first uh, successful patient, but it worked. But they decided this was never going to be a business. Making a product custom for each person, or making a new drug for each person, that takes time, costs a lot of money, too specific, there's no test for efficacy because it it's only good for one person. So the test of efficacy is they give it to the person see if it works. So they decide it's not a good business. How are we gonna make money doing this? We need something off the shelf. One size fits all. That's what we need to make a drug. So by then, Lee Nadler in Boston had discovered this target on all normal B cells called CD20. And IDEC made a, an antibody against CD20. I told him that this was a bad idea. <laughs> I told him it was going to kill their normal B cells. We need our normal B cells. We need an immune system. We're going to make, create immune deficiency if we give this to people. Uh, but they gave it to monkeys, and the monkeys didn't drop dead. So we went ahead and we did the, the clinical trial with this, even though I advised them that this was not going to be good. It didn't have the elegance of what we had originally designed here. Um, and it worked. 
So I'm going to show you some data in a minute. I'm going to tell you an anecdote first. This is Wendy Harpum, one of our first patients. She was an internal medicine physician. She had follicular lymphoma. Here's her case. She was 36 years old when she was diagnosed in 1990. Follicular lymphoma. She failed chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And she came to join our clinical trial of rituxan. She was one of our first patients. And she went into a partial remission, a PR here, which means that Tumors all shrunk, but they didn't completely go away. So then she entered our second clinical trial, our phase two trial. Then she had a complete remission. All her tumors went away, but it came back a year later and she had several more over the years treatments with rituxan and sometimes with chemotherapy. And in 2007, she was in remission on maintenance rituxan. And now she's 34 years from original diagnosis. Now, this is not a typical case, as the lymphoma docs in the audience will tell you, but it illustrates a couple of points. Number one, it can be used repetitively. Number two, you can combine, it's not very toxic, the side effects are very mild, you can combine it with chemotherapy. And those became the principles on which this drug gets used. And here's Wendy as a grandparent uh, many years later. She asked me to show this picture to audiences in the hopes that it would encourage people to go into clinical research. So I'm doing that. So around that time, there was a, a conference here at Stanford, industry, academia, conference, uh, a luncheon and a conference. I randomly sat next to some guy from Genentech, David Ebersman is his name, and he heard about what I was doing and he said, oh yeah, that's IDEC, we passed on this. And I said, I think it's worth another look. So he brought his bosses by and we talked and there was a deal made that saved both companies. So early in, in, that, in those years, we were publishing, as, as Steve told you, we were publishing papers on this over time and the FDA finally approved the drug here in 1997. It's an important date and I'll come back to that later. And this is the stock value of the two companies involved in making Rituxan. Uh, in yellow is Genentech and in, in blue, green or whatever it is, is uh, IDEC. And I like to show this slide because at least in this case, you didn't have to have inside information to make money in the stock market. All you had to do is read the publications and go invest in the company. Because there's about a six month delay there between the publications <laughs> and the stock becoming valuable. So this is the data that got the drug approved by the FDA. It was a pivotal trial, so-called, but everybody got the drug. There was no comparator group. And there are 166 patients and the overall response rate was 48%. And the complete response rate was only 6%. These were patients who had failed other therapies before this. But the FDA approved the drug, not on the basis of all on this efficacy, but on the fact that it was not toxic. There were no real important side effects of giving this drug. So the ratio between benefit and risk was so high that they approved the drug. This will never happen again. The FDA will never approve a drug like this in, under, with data like this again. But we are so lucky. And now uh, uh, the really good trial, the randomized trial that put the drug on the map was the tri trial done in France by the French cooperative group. This was in diffuse large B cell lymphoma, the more aggressive kind of lymphoma, where they gave the chemotherapy called CHOP, four drugs, with and without rituxan. And in the yellow curve was the outcome over time, over the years of the patients who got the rituxan added to the chemotherapy, which I told you is safe to do, compared to people who got the standard of care at the time, CHOP. So now our CHOP is the standard of care for this disease. Um, this many years later, it's still the standard of care. And we use it all the time in the clinic now. It's beginning to be challenged a little bit now, but at least up until last year, it was the standard of care, and still is, I think. That really put the drug on the map. And then the American trial led by Sandra Horning is shown here with follicular lymphoma, another kind of lymphoma, in two different ways of measuring the outcome. And again, big advantage to the group randomly assigned to get the antibody versus just the, um, the control group. So this is Richard H Miller and Sandra Horning uh, Rich was in the audience here. He didn't know I was going to show this slide. Uh, 
their husband and wife, by the way, they were both fellows. They met in fellowship here at Stanford. So that's an advertisement for being a fellow at Stanford. <laughs> they were both on the faculty and now they're both serial entrepreneurs. And, and uh, this, this is not a recent picture, but they look just like this today. As you can see, we're just sitting right over there. The second big surprise was this drug works for other diseases too. One time I had a patient come to clinic with uh, arthritis and he had lymphoma and we gave him Libertoxan. He came back a few weeks later and said, I don't know about my lymphoma, but my joints feel better. And it turns out that this drug works in many different autoimmune diseases as well. And here's a list of some of the diseases and some are approved indications by the FDA for the use of this drug or copycat drugs like it against the same target, CD20. For all these different diseases, and some of them are not, were not thought to be due to B cells and antibody, uh, uh, pathogenic antibodies like ITP or, 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 or uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, but rather they were thought to be due by t caused by T cells, and yet the drug that targets B cells treats these diseases. So now this drug is, last year I think there was a, it sold uh, annual sales of about $4 billion worldwide. And I think most of the use of this drug, or much of it is for non-lymphoma diseases, autoimmune diseases, in addition to lymphoma. So Charles Schultz knew that antibodies are wholesome, they're natural, they're without side effects. And as I told you, I counseled against using this antibody because I thought it would be harmful to the immune system. And I wasn't completely wrong because uh, the antibody depletes normal B cells. These are the normal blood, uh, B cells from, uh, from the blood and it goes away and last the, the uh, very short course of the antibody, B cells are gone from the blood and from the tissues. It takes about a year before they come back. See the time course here. Well, when COVID came along, it turned out that when we tried to vaccinate people with an antigen that they'd never seen before, the COVID virus vaccine, the mRNA vaccine, that if they had this drug within the last three months, they didn't respond, they didn't make any antibody to the vaccine. But if they had it more than a year ago, they responded just like normal people. You can't see my pointer, but this bar on the right here is a year ago and in between, you see it takes about a year for it to, the immune deficiency, the inability to respond to the COVID vaccine wears off with time. Uh, and this would be true for any, anything new that the patient had never seen before, the person had never seen before, that if you give rituxan, they're not gonna to respond to anything new. But if you vaccinate them first, before you give rituxan, then they'll respond normally. And that's what we were able to show from our clinic. Uh, these are the patients here on the right, in the red, not responding if they got rituxan for their lymphoma first and then got vaccinated. But in green on the diagram there, if we gave them the toxin, if we gave them the vaccine first, they responded normally, and that's what's shown here. And this, I can't, my pointer doesn't point to the white. Those are normal immune responses to the COVID vaccine. And then we treated them afterwards with rituxan and whatever they needed, and they maintained their responses. So the principle here is, is vaccinate first and treat later. We were actually able to delay people's initiation of lymphoma therapy to get them vaccinated, so protect them against COVID uh, infection. And this will be true for anything new. But once you've established immunologic memory, rituxan doesn't hurt you. And uh, that we knew already. So this is now, when we come to boosters, once you've got memory and you're getting a boosters, then, then it's a different story. But this is a first vaccine, something they've never seen before. Vaccinate first, treat afterwards. But looking back on this, on this story of rituxan and looking at data now from the United States, the SEER data registry, over the years in green shows the five-year survival rate for lymphoma. And in blue shows the annual death rate from lymphoma in the United States. And something happened in 1997 that bent the curve. I can't prove to you that that was rituxan, but I strongly suspect that it was. It wasn't the only thing that improved over the years. When we have PET scans now, and we have, we have other you know, ways of uh, dealing with infections. And, but I think that rituxan did this, and I, it's a good bet. And 
this is the best part of the whole story of rituxan, I think, looking back over the years to see what public in, impact it had. $4 billion a year, changing, bending the curve, and the customized antibody is the elegant idea, the customization and the whole clever strategy that we were started with uh, has fallen by the wayside and has never done it again. So things have to be practical to have a public health influence. Now, in the years since rituxan was approved in 1997, a whole bunch of new antibodies were approved by the FDA for all kinds of diseases, including cancer. So you see on the list there, Herceptin is here, and, and uh, Avastin is here, and Herbitex is here for all different kinds of diseases. This is just the first 10 years or so. By now, there are probably hundreds of thousands of antibodies used in the clinic every day. I mean, how many people here have used an antibody, monoclonal antibody, or gotten an antibody, monoclonal antibody? Raise your, raise your hand. Nobody's used one or gotten one? Yeah, it's pretty prevalent. Uh, so what I want to say about all of these products that are made it to the clinic, I hear the comment, none of these is tumor specific. Each one of them has a target that's not on the tumor somewhere else in the body. In the case of Herbitux, we know about the skin being a toxic uh, uh, organ for, for that treatment. And so how good does an antibody have to be? How specific does it have to be to be useful as a therapy? And I think that question still is out there. And there are going to be many more invented and, and discovered in the future. Um, and the criteria for how tumor specific it needs to be has to be accompanied by biology of what happens to the tumor cell when this antibody binds to it. Does it die? Does it stop proliferating? Does it stop metastasizing? And who cares whether it binds somewhere else in the body as long as it doesn't cause trouble? So. All of this is to say that antibodies have been a huge success, and the people who invented the hybridoma technology never patented their discovery, never thought it was useful for anything. They were only trying to figure out how the immune system works. And now we're so lucky to have all these uh, wonderful products that target the tumor in a specific, more or less specific way. And now they've been engineered to be carrying radiation, they can be binding two things at the same time, they can carry drugs, uh, they can engineer T cells to kill based on recognizing what they recognize. So we have a whole huge list of stories that could be told at this point about targeting the tumor with monoclonal antibodies. But the whole field had a huge change recently in the last decade. These two guys, who won the Nobel Prize for this, it figured out that there are targets not on the tumor cell, but on the immune system cells, creating a paradigm shift for how to use antibodies to treat cancer. So the original idea was treat the tumor. The new idea is treat the immune system. Take the, it takes the brakes off the immune system that's already in the body, already recognizing the tumor, and unleash the immune system to go around the body and find the cancer cells and let the immune system do the killing, not the antibody do the killing. And this has transformed the practice of oncology. We have many different kinds of cancer that are successfully treated by targeting the immune system, so-called checkpoint blockade, blocking the checkpoints of the immune system with antibodies that target those targets. So we have the antibodies, they target the tumor, now we have the antibodies that target the immune system, but that implies that there's an immune system already in the, in the body able to recognize the cancer, and all it has to do is be encouraged to go after the cancer better. So that's rekindled the idea of cancer vaccination. Now I want to turn from antibodies, passive therapy with antibodies, to active vaccination to trigger the immune system to fight cancer. And I'm quoting here from a famous cardiac surgeon from Stanford, Norman Shumway, who was talking about artificial hearts at the time. And he said, this is an idea that may always be in our future. And maybe that's true of cancer vaccination. It's not a new idea, it's an old idea. There have been many failed attempts in the past, but now we have mRNA that worked for COVID and it worked better than other ways of vaccinating for COVID. 
And that's a new opportunity to use the technology of my, uh, messenger RNA, which codes for a protein that the protein can trigger the immune system. And so this brings us back to the idea of customized products. Because every patient's tumor has mutations in the DNA. Here on the left, my pointer doesn't point to it. And those mutations can be discovered by sequencing the genes of the tumor and sequencing the genes of the person's normal cells, finding the things that are different between the tumor and the normal in the DNA in the form of mutations. Those mutations can code for abnormal proteins that are chopped up and brought to the surface and recognized by, by T cells. So the same companies that gave us the COVID vaccine, Moderna and BioNTech, Pfizer, um, are returning now to the idea they were originally working on, which was this, treating cancer with mRNA vaccines. And so there are clinical trials now that are summarized here by these two companies and many kinds of tumors. I, I don't wanna go into detail in this, but you see the two companies, BioNTech and, and, and Genentech in collaboration and, and, and Moderna. And I'm gonna look, so show you some data from the most exciting data on this we have so far, which was just presented last month at a national meeting. This is high-risk melanoma, patients who've had their tumor resected, but it was large, it spread to lymph nodes, and they were highly at risk for recurrence with melanoma somewhere else in their body. They were randomized to get a vaccine made custom for them, each one a different vaccine custom for them, based on 34 different mutations that were strung together from the DNA sequencing of their tumors into one product that made RNA that coded for those 34 different mutations, each patient a different vaccine, and shows the difference in outcome in green here, the vaccinated patients, and yellow, the control patients who got the standard of care at the current time. And this is Jeff Weber, the picture up in the right corner, who presented this data just last month, the three-year follow-up for this trial, showing that this is working. So let's return to the question, is it worth it to go to the trouble of discovering and making for each patient a customized vaccine product? Uh, well, I guess so, because it looks like it works. So this is technology that's really been developed over the years that's now being applied to the problem of cancer vaccines. And uh, maybe this is worth it. Maybe this is the, our future. And maybe everybody will get a customized vaccine done this way in the future. And I want to just give a shout out to two collaborators of, of mine and many of ours here at Stanford in the chemistry department, Bob Weymouth and, and Paul Winder, who've invented polymers that can bind to the RNA that you make, deliver it across the cell membrane and release it for expression in the, inside the cell. And these polymers, for reasons we don't understand, can guide the RNA to certain organs in the body and shown in the scan here with the mice. And the first mouse on the left has delivered the RNA to express the protein that we can image just to the spleen and nowhere else in the body, or just to the liver in the second mouse, or just to, sorry, just to the lungs in the second mouse, and just to the liver in the third mouse. And it's the ones that go to the spleen that I'm interested in, because that's where the immune cells are that can respond and trigger the immune system potentially against anything you want, including these genetic changes in the tumor cells. And so we're currently doing my vaccine target, my original target, the idiotype, combined with these polymers to see if we can, once again, show that this can be worth it. But the final story I wanna tell is, a, is another strategy of vaccination that we call in situ therapeutic vaccination, where we, inject something into the tumor, non-custom made, to stimulate the immune system locally in one place in the body and get the immune system to respond to the antigens that are in the tumor that we don't pre-identify. And those immune system cells travel throughout the body and are encouraged to seek and destroy tumor elsewhere in the body. And what we're injecting is a molecule, a piece of DNA with that many Cs and Gs Cs and Gs that are present in bacterial DNA, but in vertebrate DNA, there are very few of them and they tend to be methylated. So there's a receptor called the toll-like receptor number nine in the cells of the immune system that see this piece of DNA with these 
it looks like a danger thing, triggers the immune system. And we inject this locally into the tumor microenvironment and get the immune system to go when it was stalled. And again, diagrammatically, if we have a tumor on two sides of the body here in this mouse, and we inject one with this CPG molecule, the receptor triggers these cells that activate the immune system. The T cells then travel throughout the body and treat the tumor on the other side of the animal. And in preclinical experiments, mostly done by Edith Sagiv Barfi in our lab, have shown that this really works in the animal. And the question is, can it work in people? And so we designed a clinical trial a number of years ago to test this in lymphoma patients, where the patients have many tumors throughout their body, like Mr. Carr did, like I showed you. And the radiation is given to one of them to kill a few cancer cells, low doses. And the CPG is injected into that one site. And we look not only at the treated site, but we look at the other sites throughout the body. And here's an example of one of our patients on this trial, where we have tumor uh, in the, uh, under the armpits here, these lumpy things here and these lumpy things here. And we're treating a, a lymph node tumor site on the back of his neck. And over time, you can see what happens. They advance. So there's a complete response and the tumors go away. So we've done a series of small pilot investigator initiated trials with materials like this molecule we're injecting coming and supported by uh, grants and also by contracts from the companies that make them. And our best result is shown here, the way we summarize these clinical trials. This is called a waterfall plot here on the left where every patient uh, has a pair of bars. If the bars are going up, the tumor is growing by x-ray measurements. The bars are going down, the tumors are shrinking. And the pair of bars are with or including or not including the treated site, where we're treating one site and measuring all sites. So you see all the bars are going down. That's good. A lot of them are going really down. And on the right is the spider, what we call the spider plot, where we look over time to see how, low, how far down they go and how long it lasts. And you see many of them are lasting years um, and still in remission. So this is a pretty good result and pretty, pretty gratifying that this concept is actually working. Um, I have to say that this is low-grade lymphoma we're looking at here. And most of these responses are not complete responses. They're partial. They don't go to zero. They don't go to 100, minus 100. And we have other drugs in the clinic now that can do at least as well as this or not better. So this is a really good pr proof of principle, but it's not going to change the standard of care for lymphoma. If this, were, if this were lung cancer or breast cancer or colon cancer, this would be a great result. But the problem there is we have to have an injectable site of tumor where the antigens are that we're, and where the immune system is needs to be activated. And repetitively injecting deep sites in the body is prob problem to uh, technical problem and not always safe. So other people have gotten the idea, maybe we can deliver this immune activator systemically by hooking it up to other molecules that know how to find the tumor. And so these several companies, names over here, uh, founder of one of these companies sitting in the back row, uh, Ed Engelman have been hooking up these uh, immune activating molecules to antibodies, monoclonal antibodies, to deliver them to the tumor in the body wherever it is, inject them in the bloodstream and let them find the tumor and home in on the tumor and bring the, the uh, immune activator to the tumor to trigger these immune responses. So these are clinical trials going on. Uh, there are some issues that have come up. I won't go into them now. But I, want, I use this to introduce the final thing I want to show you, which is an amazing collaboration between three labs here at Stanford, mine and Jennifer uh, Cochran and Carolyn Bertozzi's lab, catalyzed by a graduate student at the time, Caitlin Miller, and he did Sagiv Barfi, he was a postdoc in my lab, taking advantage of a molecule called PIP, a small protein, I think comes from cucumber plants, that for some reason binds in the body to targets on tumor cells. And here's an image showing this PIP molecule going to tumor cells in a mouse on one side of the body. If we put tumor on two sides of the body, these are breast cancer tumors. The PIP molecule goes there, and you can image it. You use this to image the tumors. But even better, 
you can use this to deliver this immune activator that we're talking about because it's a piece of DNA that can be chemically linked. Uh, Carolyn Bertozzi's methodology of, of click chemistry, so-called, to make a molecule chemically with this pro small PIP protein coupled to the immune activator piece of DNA going to the tumor and activating the immune system after systemic injection of the molecule. And just one example of the preclinical experiment that worked, it didn't work the first time, but it worked. Uh, this is breast cancer, genetic breast cancer in a mouse. And this mice gets, this strain of mice gets breast cancer in all their mammary glands. There are eight mammary glands in mice. Independent tumors in all their mammary glands genetically, kind of like BRCA genes on steroids for mice. And so these mice get these tumors here on the right. Uh, and if they've been injected with the PIP molecule coupled to the immune activator, it's the blue curve on the right. Uh, remarkable effectiveness in this model. And it's T cell dependent. If we eliminate T cells from the animal, this doesn't work. So it's not just a drug killing the tumor that it goes to, it's an immune activator of T cells working on the antigens in the tumor microenvironment. So this has led to a new company called Two Step Therapeutics, just founded in the last month or so. Uh, and here are the founders of the company. And the CEO is Caitlin Miller, who is the graduate student who became what we call an entrepreneur in residence here at Stanford. Not a postdoc, but an entrepreneur in residence in the, uh, uh, the IMA program uh, that we have here at Stanford. And this is the first company that spun out of this IMA program. And uh, their goal is to develop this immune activator systemically delivered, hopefully to treat solid tumors in patients in the future. So this, this whole last part, this in situ vaccination idea, we're triggering the immune system locally to infiltrate the tumor. That the immune system that's infiltrating the tumor already, triggering it, we don't have to know the identity of the antigens on the tumor. We don't have to discover anything. It's not, it's off the shelf. It's not a customized product. We can generate systemic T cell immune responses against the tumor. Uh, and there's a potential for using it in a neoadjuvant sense before the surgeon removes the cancer, knows where it is, knows where he's going to operate, maybe inject the, the cancer first and then remove it, leaving behind a trained immune system to go after metastases that may be there already. And the targeted delivery ideas make this potentially practical. So it would be impossible for me to let you know how all of these people contributed to these stories I've told you today, and a few stories I've not told you today. Um, but there have been a lot of people involved in this work, and I've mentioned some of them, even shown pictures of some of them along the way. But this is an example of the lab meeting we had in February that I had to give a talk in February in Boston, and I wanted a picture of the lab. In Boston in February, this became a really good recruiting tool. <laughs> And I'd like to dedicate all this to my former teacher, mentor, friend, Saul, Ro Saul Rosenberg, <clears throat> who famously at Grand Rounds and Medical Grand Rounds said this one day, pick one disease, study it well, and it will take you to the ends of the earth. And I had a chance to tell Saul that it worked. I did it and it worked. Because here's the king of Saudi Arabia giving me a prize for a project that began at the Weizmann Institute in Israel just to show you how universal what all this is. So I'll stop there and we'll take questions if there are any. Thank you. And I, um, I think it's so fascinating that everything has come full circle, right? You started off with anti idiotype antibodies and now we're talking about personalized vaccines. So in your original patient who was treated, I think nowadays we would classify them as a sort of an exceptional responder. Were you ever able to study, you know, in that person why they had such an exceptional response or did we able to gain any insights as to why they had one treat it sounds like they had one treatment and had a very sustained response? It's a great question and we thought about it over and over again over the years. He had cardiac surgery uh, sometime after he was in remission. And the surgeon said, do you want some bone marrow? And I said, yes, give me all you can get from the rib. 
and we searched for antibodies that he might have made against his own idiotype. And maybe we, we were actually vaccinating him and he made it, they subsequently made his own antibodies. And we, we, the only way we could look for them was whether we'd block the antibody that we had that bound to his tumor cell. And we could never find any such thing in him. We tried looking for T cells in him and the assays for T cells are a little more problematic when we could never find an explanation. But when we treated him for about a month and he went into remission for 30 years, it must have been triggering some host response in him because the antibodies were only there for, for a few, few months at, at most. So it must have been something that triggered him and that get, once again gives me the hope that we will learn how to vaccinate deliberately in one of these tricky ways that, and many other ways people are trying. That's a great question. And we tried this for other people too. We could never find that they made an antibody that would block our antibody, which is our way of looking for it. Um, this is from Kaushik Malapati. How do we predict whether monoclonal antibodies will be effective against specific types of cancer? Are there markers like tumor mutational burden and microsatellite instability that could be broadly good markers for monoclonal antibodies? How to screen for antibodies for the future is a question that we've had ever since hybridomas were invented and still going on. Uh, we talked about this with a group of students this morning. How good does an antibody need to be? What does it have to do? Is it just recognizing the difference or is it actually doing biology on its target? And we have a, we've actually uh, working on an antibody now that has no specificity for the tumor, but it has biologic effects preventing metastases to occur, inhibiting the motility of the cancer cell. So there may be clever ways of screening for the end effect that you want to get other than just recognition of the difference. So um, the tumor mutational burden is, a, is an expression of how many mutations you can find in the tumor, some of which would code for funny proteins. So if you know the mutation, maybe you can look for that protein, maybe you can make an antibody against such a predicted protein, and maybe that's a way of the future of you know, looking for new antibodies for therapy for, for tumors. But these mutations that people are finding in, in tumors are rarely the ones that cause the cancer. Most of the time, they're mutations that happen along the way as the clone evolved and are not present on every cancer cell in the body because they diverge as the population expands. So that's why Moderna is taking 34 shots on goal with their choices of how to make a vaccine because they figure that no one cancer cell is gonna have all of the mutations, but some cancer cells are gonna be missing some of the ones they choose. So 34, I don't know how they arrived at 34, but that's what they arrived at. And they're taking a lot of shots. Um, but if you would find one that would be present in all the cancer cells, that would be a good candidate to make an antibody against. You target that. Hopefully it would be a surface protein so the antibody could see it on the surface. Um, and hopefully it would be present in all the cells. That's why I love my original choice. It, that's, everything I said about it being perfect is still true. It's on all the cancer cells, not, no, not on normal cells, functionally very significant on the target, and, uh, but needing to be made uniquely for every person. Hardly a month goes by when I don't get a call or uh, the email, will you make an antibody for me? In fact, in the last month, I've had two, heard about two companies that are starting up to rekindle this idea of making customized antibodies. And who knows, maybe these days they can figure out a way to make money at it. Maybe it'll be worth doing. Yes? So I'm very interested in your finding with the Rituxan and the vaccines. Let's take HPV, which only works by preventing infection, but it works maybe for a lifetime, at least for 20 to 30 years. It doesn't work if the patient's already been exposed to that virus. Now that patient who's been vaccinated gets Rituxan. Does that make them susceptible to those viruses again? And then they're no longer immune to prevent the cancers? And should we be studying that? No, I, I don't think so because the patient who's received, the person who's received the HPP vaccine has got immunologic memory. That resides in the long-lived T cells and the plasma cells that stay in your body long-term and they do not have the target for rituxan, those cells that make the immunologic memory. So that's the lucky thing here. We're not wiping out memory, only wiping out new responses to something the patient has never seen before. 
So if we vaccinate first, like you're doing with HPV, then you can feel, freely try, uh, treat with rituxan and not worry about it. Their B cells for a year will have no effect. Those B cells are the new ones looking for something new. The memory resides in cells derived from the original B cells that no longer have the target for rituxan. What a lucky accident. Huh? <laughs> Question from Mark Selby. Given that CPG activates B cells and dendritic cells, can you dissect the relative contribution of each in the anti-tumor effects? Well, we've tried to deplete those particular cells, but the antibody, again, with antibodies. And uh, in certain cases, we can interfere with the effect, in certain cases not. It turns out if we deplete B cells, if we deplete T cells, the effect goes away. I've told you that. It also is true if you deplete B cells, the effect goes away, the vaccine effect. And that the B cells are not only making antibodies, they're also good presenters of antigen to T cells. So we're probably interrupting some requirement for antigen presentation. If we, we don't really know how to deplete dendritic cells very well, but they're key players in triggering immune responses, as we know. So uh, that's what, there are also genetic knockouts, uh, strains of mice that you can separately um, get rid of cell population, but then you have developmental issues of the mouse that override the original question of that and that only being the, the missing ingredient. So it's a great question. And it, it, it's not only a question that gets to the way things work, but it gets to the question of how we can make it work even better uh, if we get other targets to go along to combine with them. So you mentioned one of the objections to customize uh, antibodies was uh, safe, testing safety and efficacy for a patient. So I'm just wondering what has kind of changed to make personalized, customized vaccines more viable? Uh, nothing's changed. It's just the appetite for risk. <laughs> and I think that uh, it depends on how difficult it is to make the customized product. Uh, high throughput sequencing of DNA, do that quickly. Predicting mutations, that's quick. Predicting epitopes, coded for, that, for those mutations, quick. Making a messenger RNA, stitching together 34 of them together, uh, that's modestly quick. Um, but, and, and that, at the end of the day, could be cost effective. Uh, there are other personalized strategies, more or less, that, that are much more difficult. Making a customized antibody is difficult. Once you know the target, you have to get, find, discover an antibody against that target by some kind of screening method, and then you have to produce that antibody in large quantities of the antibody protein, passively administer it. So, that's kind of expensive. Making an engineered cell outside the body like we do today for CAR T cells, uh, it's customized in the sense that the gene you're putting in is the same gene for everybody, targeting the same target, but you're making a, a product, a living cell outside the body and growing that cell. And uh, that's pretty expensive. Uh, but again, we do it because it works. Uh, it's, it's difficult to imagine that becoming a widespread worldwide treatment for anything unless more clever ways of getting to the end would be invented. And there are some ideas for more clever ways to getting to the end. I hope I answered it. I did actually. So it sounds like it's more of a cost thing because um, the cost has dropped, so the appetite uh, has increased for that. But on the safety side, there's still really no advances to make sure that a personalized drug would be safe for a specific patient. Is that right? Well, there's also the time delay that's involved with whatever you have to do to make the product on a customized basis. If you can make it in a day, it's, off, it's virtually off the shelf. If, you, if it takes you a couple months to make the product, then you have to have somebody who can wait that long and how, how you would use it and when you would use it in relation to the diagnosis of cancer, it, it becomes an issue. Um, that's why I like the injection idea prior to surgery. Uh, and we modeled this with animal models where we have the tumor, and we have the metastases. The tumor is, is controlled by surgery, local tumor, but the metastases will grow. But if we inject the tumor, get the immune system responding, T cells, and then remove the tumor, the T cells will control the metastases. So that's a model for, you can imagine how that would work in clinical practice, and that would be 
off the shelf, quick, no cost, no cheap cost of goods. So I'm hoping that's an idea that will stick. I just want to thank Dr. Levy. Thank you all for your attention. Please join us. After.